School of Business uh, webinar on effective online learning. That uh, I am very, very pleased that we have this wonderful opportunity to have three experts on online teaching to talk about how do we manage effectively the online learning on a very stressful COVID uh, environment. Uh, I'd like to thank our two student groups, the uh, Brooklyn Chapter of National Association of Black Accountants and the Kaufman Student Leadership Council for co-producing this webinar. This webinar grew out of discussions and feedbacks from our students. Uh, given the fact that we're going to be fully online this fall and also under this very unprecedented, unique, stressful environment. We hope this webinar will help all of our students to manage and navigate the challenges in online learning and all uh, alleviate some of the stress that you might be experiencing. So eventually, we hope everyone every one of our students will have a very successful fall semester and an online experience. Um, so before we start, I'd like to announce a couple of the housekeeping rules so that we can make this online webinar experience uh, that we enjoy. First, this webinar will be recorded. And the recording as well as this uh, PowerPoint slides will be posted to Kaufman website after the session. Once they're posted, all of you will receive an email that will tell you the links to this webinar as well as the um, PowerPoint. Uh, given the number of students participating today, uh, we are going to ask you to submit your question through the chat box. So type in your question during the presentation, anything you'd like to ask any of the panelists, uh, then send that question to our two student co-hosts, Ashley and Elena. Ashley and Elena will be reading the chat box all the way through and selecting questions. At the end of this uh, three panelist discussion, we will have time to go over those questions and to answer those questions by our panelists. So, thank you very much, and uh, let's get everything started. The, today's panelist, the first one is Professor Richard Wento, Director of Learning Center of Brooklyn College. Second panelist is Professor Miles Basso, the Deputy Chairman of Business Management Department of Kaufman School of Business. And the third panelist is Professor Manley Fox, Assistant Ooh. Professor of Children and Youth Studies and Sociology, as well as the Director of Brooklyn College's Center for Teaching and Learning. And we are very lucky to have those three experts to talk about online learning and expectations from faculty, and expectations from students and everything that we can help you through this process. So without further ado, let's start with Professor Richard Linto. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hu, and thank you for providing this great forum for us to have uh, a chat about preparing our students for the remote learning world as we know it heading into the fall 20 semester. So for everyone listening, the first thing we have to do to hopefully improve our odds for a successful uh, academic semester online is make sure we have the proper tools first and foremost. Uh, if you will look at the screen, this is a kind of virtual front desk dashboard, if you will, that Brooklyn College has created. It's kind of like a one-stop shopping area, if you will, for all things remote learning, where all of the resources that you would typically need if you were on campus, walking around office to office, are really centrally located, so it's not a whole lot of digging on the internet, looking for certain links. Everything is really consolidated in a very coherent, organized way. So if we can uh, click on where it says getting started, I just want to take a quick peek at what that looks like.
think if you just right click on it and open, it should take us to the web page. Is this the web page? Uh, no, you have to right click on it and it should say open link and that'll take us directly to the web page. Okay. If not, if not, if it doesn't work, I can just kind of articulate what's on there basically. If, um, it's not going to come up. Basically, again, um, it's a page to help you get the technology and the resources that you need. It's about laptops, tablets. It's about providing stronger Wi-Fi access if need be. It's links to uh, information technology services. So if you're having difficulty in navigating through um, because of a poor setup maybe on your end, they can certainly help you. And just, uh, again, improve your connections and make sure you have the proper technology. Where it says remote learning, that link would take you to other resources that are more to do with online learning, specifically assuming we have the technology set up. The first thing you would see under that link is a fantastic student-led video about navigating through Blackboard, which is going to be super important for this fall semester because Blackboard in many ways is going to be kind of a lifeline uh, between navigating through class, communicating with your instructor, communicating with your peers and getting a sense of when your assignments are due, what's expected of you, when are exams due, how do I submit work? So taking the time to kind of click on that link and allow yourself to kind of um, just be super familiar with Blackboard and utilize it to its fullest capabilities is really going to help and improve the way you kind of navigate through the course and receive information and submit information. So again, um, I'm sure instructors maybe have their own platforms here and there, but by and large, it's primarily uh, seemingly going to be uh, Blackboard based. So we can move to the next one. So home, your new classroom. Uh, in, in my case, it's my new office and there are some good things about it. There are a lot of challenges too. Uh, the first thing, once you have all the technology and everything set up the way it should be, is to try your best to establish your study environment to make sure that it enables your routine. Treat your online courses like a traditional in-person course. Be present, be ready to work. If your course has live meeting days and times, show up at those live meetings. Ideally have your camera on, your sound on. As an instructor, I really feed off the energy of the students in the room and I can see kind of affirming nods and I know when to move forward, when to pull back. And if you're a teacher and you're looking at a lot of blank screens, you really don't get that kind of interaction. So it helps me kind of read the room, if you will. And I think your instructors will probably feel the same way. Plus you're more engaged and participating. Um, Identify a workspace that's quiet. This is a challenge. I realize that it's a challenge for me as well. Uh, organized and as distraction free as possible and available for use when you need it. Avoid distractions when you can. Get headphones to avoid disturbing others. Not everyone in your apartment needs to know pre-calculus. So having headphones and a microphone might be a good idea. Plus, I also find that having earbuds in or a good headset reduces a lot of ambient noise and kind of connects me a lot more to what's going on on screen. And it just improves my concentration uh, overall. Ask your friends, family and colleagues to respect your work mode during dedicated class and study time. Just because you're sitting in your living room doesn't mean you're accessible for a casual chat about anything and everything. You're in school. Technically, you're in your living room or your office, but you're attending a live class and it's important uh, to convey that as best as you can to the people that are in your immediate surroundings. And of course, it helps if you log off social media because we don't need those extra distractions as well. Okay, next screen. Time management. It's really important to have an effective calendar system and it's especially important to have a consolidated calendar. I mean, I'm guilty of this as well. At one point I had my Outlook calendar, Google, I had one on my phone, I had one here, one there. And it's just a manic situation to check five different calendars to figure out where am I going next, what to do, what am I doing? I think it's probably helpful to have it built into whatever piece of technology you're utilizing for schoolwork, whether it's your laptop or even your phone. We seem to live and die by you know, our phone. Whatever works for you is fine. Just make sure you consolidate all of those things. When you go to class in the next week or so, um, 
review each course outline and make sure in that calendar you're entering all your exam dates, all due dates for papers, anything and everything you need to know in the spectrum of courses you're taking need to be consolidated in that one area. Don't just set reminders the day a test is due though, scale back. Set reminders for 10 days before the exam is due. Make a coherent study plan. Make sure you have time to uh, chat with your professor if need be about assignment clarity or test clarity. Drop in the learning center, which we'll talk about momentarily. Just be sure that there is a plan way in advance that enables you to reach your full academic potential. Allow time for the possibility of running into technical difficulties. Look, our Wi-Fi is not always going to work. And if your Wi-Fi is good 23 hours of the day, chances are that one hour of the day that you need it the most, it might go down. It's been me. Right before this webinar, I was testing a pair of headphones and they didn't work. So I had to swap them out right away. Just don't always assume the technology is going to cooperate because you want it to cooperate. So just leave yourself some lead time just in case of these technical glitches, which can throw us off a little bit. Uh, schedule time to do coursework, study, and group work. Adhere to your schedule. Just because we're home, it doesn't mean that we have to have this kind of informal setup. And it can happen that way. We can lapse into that because our surroundings are somewhat comfortable, but just make sure you adhere to that formal structure. It's really, really important. And obviously seek help when you need it. And you can go back um, to those first two links we saw to those kind of uh, dashboards on the Brooklyn College website where all of the help you would seemingly need, everything from academic support to personal counseling to information technology to medical, anything is located on that site. Okay. Requirements for your courses at the beginning of the semester, again, create a master chart or a list with all of the expectations about each course. And it's super important to realize that every course is unique, okay? And your instructors will likely have differing protocols when it comes to how do I submit work and what is virtual class participation in this course like? And how are we going to take exams in this particular course? It's not going to be completely uniform. You might have one instructor that wants work submitted via Dropbox or Google Docs or in a link on um, Blackboard or any different means. And it's really you know, important because it's very simple to kind of mix these things up and start submitting work in ways that your instructor doesn't want. So just make sure that each course has a clear kind of user's manual. How do I submit work? How do I participate? How do I do all these things? Because again, uh, they probably in all likelihood won't be cookie cutter as they're not when you're meeting in person as well. Okay, next slide. This is important to remember. Just because you're learning remotely does not mean you're alone. And it might seem that way because you're in this vacuum and you're studying but there are a lot of really, really good resources to engage you about the coursework and about the process and about best practices, which is a segue for our next chat. Uh, next slide, please. The Brooklyn College Learning Center. So I'm the director of the center, and basically we offer free academic support, free peer tutoring via Zoom. Um, it's a very simple process. Uh, all you do is literally click on the link of the course that you want tutoring in during a specific day and time. There's no advanced reservation necessary, no RSVPs, no calling ahead. In fact, if we go to the next slide, I'll show you a little bit what that schedule looks like. So let's just say for argument's sake, you're in chemistry two. Okay, great, here I am. Uh, Mondays, okay, that'll work. I'm free two to three, that's the tutor. There's your Zoom meeting ID. Bing, click here to join and you're in. Super easy, broken down by course. We are planning to have an excess of 40 different courses offered uh, in the fall semester uh, for tutoring and support. Just make sure you bookmark our page, that the web address that was on the previous slide, and check in you know, early and often for additions to our schedule. In addition to regular peer tutoring, we also have exam review sessions where our tutors lead kind of bigger cumulative reviews on material that might be relevant to the next big exam, whether it's a midterm or final you're taking. And there's a lot more information about that on our website as well. Next slide, please. Now, writing support is a little bit different because writing is just one-on-one. -on -one. So in this case, you do need an actual appointment. Uh, the, let's say you're working on a paper and you're halfway through and you want some feedback from a tutor. 
it's a good idea to email us, the writing tutors, at the address that will be on the Learning Center's website and just give the tutor a head start to review the material. Also, in terms of uh, what you're giving to the tutor, please also attach a copy of the actual assignment just so they can make sure that the assignment kind of matches you know, the headspace where you're at and what kind of work you're doing so far to make sure it's relevant. Once the tutor has reviewed your submission, then there's a live Zoom chat where you can engage in a conversation. The tutor will bring up things that he or she may have noticed about your paper and really ask you questions about where you're at, where you're at in terms of research, formatting, things of that nature. It just helps a little bit to give the tutor a head start because it might be a pretty big paper. And just a word of advice, if you have a 20-page paper and it's due in a half hour, it's probably not the best practice to reach out to a tutor at that time and say, you know, can you help fix my grammar? It's not what it's about. We're here to help you through every uh, stage in the writing process. We can help you from the day the assignment is offered with assignment clarity. We can engage you in a conversation about forming a thesis statement. How do I uh, identify a proper research? Where do I go? How do I format it? In theory, you can connect with the same tutor three, four, five times and have them write kind of shotgun with you through the entire journey of you writing this paper. So maybe the day the paper is due, maybe it just needs a little quick uh, collaborative grammar check and then you're good to go. Just give yourself the necessary time to be successful and allow yourself to fully receive all of the support necessary the tutors can offer you. Next slide. Here's something that I'm a firm believer in about study groups. They work. I mean, we're all going to study independently on a solitary basis at times. We all have a comfy chair or a corner in our apartment or home where we just sit with our books and notes and go over everything. And that's part of the process. Um, but study groups can really maximize that study time. And it's especially important in an online environment just to have that virtual connection with your peers to kind of review material Identify one or more study partners, working groups will offer you alternative views of difficult concepts, offer you motivation to achieve better results, and help in completing your online assignments and better prepare for exams. You'll learn from each other. You'll have the benefit of perspective and insights, improve your notes, uh, motivate and support each other. Now, there's a lot of ways to form study groups. One great way is to check in with the tutor. When you check in with the tutor, all of the students that will be there will be in the class that you're also taking. So that's a prime place to start uh, soliciting folks if they want to join you. The tutor can help you organize that as well, uh, whether it's in a breakout room or just seemingly kind of encourage people to meet away from the tutor, kind of like a sidebar on an ongoing basis. And I'm sure your instructors will also help if you send your instructor an email and say, this would be great if I could do this, I'm sure they'll help you kind of pull this together via a Blackboard announcement or something to that effect. Next screen. I think a super duper study group, and look, there is a benefit to just meeting with your colleagues and your peers and talking about it, but if you could have a structure to that study group, even better. Identify a moderator, have an agenda of what the group is going to work on and the time you have allowed. Assess member strengths. Maybe I take great notes. Maybe someone else is really good at summarizing the session. Maybe someone else is really good at just overall organization. And just stay positive. And I think it's really important in this online environment that as students, we kind of support each other. We support you, you support each other, just to make sure our morale is up. I know from my tutors that meet with students virtually, I mean, we did this from March through summer too, that part of the benefit wasn't just getting the content support, you know, help in organic chemistry or in accounting, but there was a really big um, difference in morale as the session went on, as there was a human interactive engagement. And you can see dispositions improved as students connected with one another in that chat with the tutor. And a lot of times, honestly, that tutor is just kind of navigating the conversation and asking guided questions and the students are interacting amongst themselves, uh, sharing, you know, sharing the laugh and uh, really just engaging with the material. And the more you're engaged, the more you're positive, the better it's going to go overall. And I think that was my last slide. All right. Well, thank you, Professor Vento. Um, this is a great device and a lots of uh, uh, very, very useful, helpful information. Uh, not only in the slides, but also uh, we have additional links that will link to the 
Learning Center resources at the end of this PowerPoint. I strongly recommend all of our students to check those resources and take advantage of the services that Learning Center um, is providing. Um, so next, I'd like to uh, introduce our second panelist, uh, Professor Mandalin Fox. Um, she runs the Brooklyn College Center for Teaching and Learning. The Teaching and Learning Center focuses on teaching and training faculty, uh, how to conduct effective online teaching. So she would be able to provide a very uh, interesting perspective for our students to see what faculty members are being taught, uh, how to conduct effective online classes. So now I turn over to uh, Adam. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hu, thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here with the School of Business and um, with so many students here. How is everybody doing? You know where the um, reactions button is on your screen? Um, give a thumbs up. Um, so, um, I, exactly. So, we just heard from, from Rich Vento, who runs the Learning Center, and that's, as many of you probably know, it's this wonderful resource for students, um, and uh, it's focused on supporting student and student learning. Um, and I am a faculty member at Brooklyn College in the Sociology Department and Children and Youth Studies, and I am also the director of the uh, Roberta S. Matthews Center for Teaching and Learning. And we are the place where we support faculty in, um, in, in thinking about and improving um, how we all teach. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about what your faculty have been up to. Um, and I work with, um, at the Center for Teaching and Learning, um, uh, I run the Center for Teacher and Learning with Dr. Donna Granville, um, who's not here with me today, but we are both um, very excited to be talking with students and we're available anytime for, for, for ongoing discussion. The next slide, please. So ever since really, you know, March 6th, with the moment our city started to, um, uh, and our campus started to transition into this uh, situation we're all in, um, your faculty have been very busy. Um, we uh, started doing um, many, many trainings in the spring um, uh, as we did that quick pivot to remote uh, learning in March. Um, but one thing that took place is that at the end of the semester, even before the end of the semester, um, we started to transition into a different level of, of, of training and um, faculty development for learning how to teach online. So in the spring, we all just were quickly adjusting. We did our best. We, we kind of quickly transitioned from having m many of us who were teaching on, in person, we quickly transitioned from teaching in person to just doing our best in an online environment. Our lives, many of our lives were extraordinary com extraordinarily complex. Um, our city was experiencing a great deal of loss and um, uh, it was very challenging times. Um, towards in, in, at the end of April, during May, we all started to reflect on what was going on and, and our experiences in the spring. Um, at that point, we kind of knew this was not necessarily, we knew we were gonna be continuing to be remote through the summer. We didn't yet know what was gonna happen in the fall, but we knew there was a strong chance we were still gonna be remote in the fall. And so we started to begin to prepare. Um, and we really started to prepare very seriously um, beginning in early May. So from early May until now, your faculty, many of your faculty have been taking courses. There's multiple um, courses that have been made available to faculty that they've been able to engage with um, to learn about how to teach online. Uh, in, this, in the Koppelman School of Business, you have a lot of faculty who are actually very experienced in teaching online. But um, for those of us who are new to teaching online, there's a lot to learn about how to do it. It's a different way of teaching. It can be extraordinarily engaging. Um, there can be a lot of really exciting and innovative pedagogy that takes place, meaning like how we learn, but um, but it's a skill. We have to learn how to do it. We have to learn about the platforms. We all have to learn about how to use Zoom if we're using Zoom or how to use all the different features of Blackboard if we're using Blackboard. And we also have to learn about 
how to uh, create a learning environment where we can all think together um, and meet our learning goals, whatever they are for the course that we're in. And so your faculty have been engaged, um, uh, very highly engaged throughout the whole summer, um, taking courses, um, we hold workshops. We've had very high attendance at all of our workshops throughout the whole summer. Um, your faculty have been very busy. Um, and um, we begin by, we, there has been a great deal of kind of rethinking our courses, beginning with our learning goals and then reimagining how it's gonna take place. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here's what we've been emphasizing in our teachings. Um, from the Center for Teaching and Learning. And then there's also been other um, courses and faculty development opportunities that your um, professors have participated in that are CUNY wide. Um, we begin with this, you know, this moment. So it is in part learning about how to teach online, but it is also about learning how to teach online in this moment we're in. Um, these are unprecedented times. And we are all um, impacted by what's going on um, in terms of the pandemic. And so we begin by that, that awareness that we're learning about teaching about online in this particular moment. Um, and that means that we're thinking about um, trauma-informed <clears throat> education. So all that means is that we're considering uh, humanity, right? We're, we're, we're thinking about ourselves as human first. We're recognizing that, there, um, that each of us bring are a host of lived experiences into the learning space and that we need to acknowledge and take seriously what our, our experiences are in this moment. Um, and that there can be in this moment, we are all experiencing um, some kinds of um, trauma or traumatic experiences. And so we as faculty need to be understanding of that, um, be empathetic about all of our different situations and create a structure for our courses that allows um, for that kind of under understanding that we are all humans doing our best to navigate a a challenging situation. Um, we also recognize um, uh, this historical moment. And, um, and so as we're thinking about um, trauma-aware pedagogy, we're also thinking about um, how to uh, recognize the ways that, or think about what we can do as faculty um, to uh, what it might mean to have a Black life-affirming campus, Black life-affirming courses, or BIPOC affirming campus and courses. And we're working hard on both of those things. Um, that's an ongoing kind of active kind of work that we're all engaged in and with, and that we'd like to engage with you, our students about as well. We also recognize that education can be an amazing kind of tool, force, power um, for moving through trauma or traumatic experiences to, um, as Kathy Davidson, Dr. Kathy Davidson talks about a place of agency, confidence, control, community, care, activism, and contribution. So I think a lot of your faculty are also thinking about how to use this historical moment in our classes so that we can all be engaged in um, making sense of what's going on and um, uh, using that work of making sense of going on to meet our learning goals. You'll have to see what happens in your classes, but um, it's gonna feel different than the spring. The, your faculty are preparing hard and they're being creative and they're thinking hard. Um, and some of the other things we stress in this online environment, since we can't all kind of walk into the room together on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, and, and be in the same space, um, we're losing some of that, but we're gaining all these other ways of kind of communicating and being together in an online way. So we emphasize with our with the faculty who um, connect with the Center for Teaching and Learning that it's really important to be in frequent and regular communication with students. If we think about uh, it, our in-person classes, sometimes we talk about how those in-person classes are sometimes designed as like you know, two big meals a week, or we all come and sit in a classroom and we have a big, you know, one, a, two sessions of really, of learning together. And then we have the work we're doing as homework in between. When we're thinking about learning online, it's more like um, small plates. Like it's more like little snacks and tastes and sips um, every day. And so we are stressing with our faculty that it's really important to be um, communicating with students in a regular way and a frequent way throughout the week. Um, and you should see that reflected in how they communicate with you via Blackboard or if they're using some other, some other um, uh, platform, whatever platform your faculty are using. 
Um, as was mentioned earlier, we are encouraging faculty to use Blackboard. It is the learning management system that we have at Brooklyn College, and it's easier for students, we think, if there's, uh, you know, the more consistency there can be across classes, um, that everyone's kind of using the same platform. So we're encouraging faculty to use Blackboard. Of course, there are particular courses where faculty need to make a decision to use whatever makes the most sense for their course. Um, but we are also encouraging fa faculty to be uh, uh, to create and craft their Blackboard sites and take a lot of care in how they set that up so that it's clear, it's engaging, that you know where to start at the beginning of the semester, you know exactly what to do each week, you can easily find your assignments, you can easily know what's coming next, you can find your, your readings, that everything is clear on their Blackboard site. So we've been working with faculty a lot on kind of learning kind of next level how to um, work with Blackboard. As you probably know, some classes are going to be um, uh, just online and that you won't actually be meeting together um, at the same time. Oh. We call that asynchronous, um, where we're, you can engage, you have work to do, probably, you know, at least, you know, you're gonna have work to do for your class every week. Sometimes it's divided up into modules, um, so that'll be maybe um, assignments due once or twice a week, um, and you'll have um, ways that you need to engage throughout the week, um, but that it will be on your own time and your own pace. It doesn't mean, asynchronous doesn't mean that you won't get a chance to know other people in your class. The faculty are working hard on making uh, uh, opportunities for learning and engagement in their classes, even when it's asynchronous. So you, Async, when, even when if you're not meeting at the same time and place, you should still get to know your professor really well. You'll still get to know other students in your class. We're all going to get a chance to experience this this semester, and we look forward to our reflections at the end of the semester. And other classes are meeting at the at a time and a place, either on Blackboard Collaborate, um, uh, so via Blackboard and video on Blackboard, or uh, via Zoom, and some classes are meeting at the same time and place each week, um, and, and some classes are doing a combination of both. Your faculty, if they haven't been in touch already, should be in touch very soon to explain very clearly how their course is going to be structured this semester so that you don't have to kind of feel confused or um, unclear about what uh, what is happening. And they're also going to be really clear with you about, as, um, as uh, we heard earlier, really clear with you about what's expected of you and how you should best engage with the course. Um, and we've also been talking with faculty about how best to think about activities like the assignments that happen um, in an online class and how to assess whether or not you're meeting learning goals and how to give feedback and how to grade in an online environment. Some of that has to change um, when we're teaching remotely rather than uh, compared to when we're teaching in person. Um, so your faculty have been working hard about rethinking those things. Next slide. Um, and so there's a couple things that are really important that you do on your end. There's probably more than a couple. But here are some of the things that are really important for you as students to do on your end to help contribute and make sure that we're all going to have positive learning experiences this semester. Um, one is make sure that your professors can contact you. That means making sure that your um, email is updated in, um, in Web Central and in Blackboard. Um, and, and your professors should, will likely be reaching out to you in the beginning of the semester to be uh, set up the, the method, how in their class, how communication is going to happen. Make sure you can participate in that. It might be that your professor uses the announcements from Blackboard to send out messages. So make sure that you're setting it up for yourself on your end so that you're going to get those messages in whatever way works best for you. The Blackboard app is great. I'm sure my, most of you have that. So having banner notifications pop up is great. Whatever works for you, take those. Take time to download the apps you need. Um, send your uh, contact information to Brooklyn College and to your professors, and make sure that you're going to get notified when your professor is trying to contact you. Um, and then check your course sites and your email frequently. Um, it's going to be really. It is a little different. Um, I think in in an, learning remotely and that you you really need to check your course site basically every day. Um, there's going to be things happening in discussion board. If, you're, if your course is using discussion board, there'll be things, um, announcements and other kinds of who knows what kinds of features your faculty are going to be using. And so just get into the habit and the rhythm of 
going in there and, and checking every day or again, setting up your Blackboard app or whatever tools you're using on your um, devices to make sure you're getting notifications. Um, next slide. And, um, and then, you know, this is going to be, we're all still in it, right? This, we're in this uh, experience together this fall. Many of us, some of us may have been taking um, online classes before uh, the pandemic, but you know, none of us really signed up for this situation where we're all te learning and teaching remotely and we're all learning together. We're all figuring this out together. Please uh, be patient and understanding. Um, we're encouraging faculty to seek student feedback um, and um, advice and suggestions for how things are going this semester. So be ready for things to kind of um, uh, tweak or adjust as the semester goes on. If you have feedback overall, or if you have ideas that you think would be really helpful for faculty at Brooklyn College to be thinking about, to do, to do differently, to start doing, please be in touch with us at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Our best experts about uh, pedagogy at Brooklyn College really are you, are the students, and um, we want to be um, working with you to make sure that our fact that we're all having the learning experiences we're here to have at, at college. Um, you deserve an excellent education and we're, um, we're excited to be, um, you know, learning and, and teaching with you this semester. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Fox. And this is uh, great information uh, for our students, as you just stated. Every student in the Brooklyn College deserve an excellent education experience, whether it is face-to-face -face or online. And I want to thank uh, Professor Fox and her team uh, for training our faculty to deliver online teaching effectively with all the best practices that she just described. And I also want to ask our students that we have high expectations for our faculty and you deserve an excellent education experience. So if you are experiencing consistently below the par uh, education online by a faculty member, uh, I'd like to know. So you can write to me directly and tell, your, tell me your experiences with specific faculty and courses. Uh, so we will work with Professor Fox and others uh, to help improve those courses and those faculty uh, teaching um, skills. So um, thank you. Let's move on to the next one, which we talk about the faculty. I am very honored to introduce you, Professor Miles Vassell. Uh, he has been a uh, really a top performer in terms of teaching, uh, great student connection, great teaching evaluations. And he is also the deputy chair of our business management department in Kaufman School of Business. So, uh, he will share some of his observation on how to be a successful, how to conduct successful online course uh, by utilizing faculty and students, joint forces, collaborating together in order to reach a excellent education experience. So Miles. Yes, thank you, Dean Hu. Uh, this is an excellent uh, idea to have this webinar and uh, Thank you to, for collaborating with the student organizations and making this a reality. Thank you, uh, Maddie and uh, Rich. Uh, before um, uh, we go on, I want you to know that I am so glad to uh, be speaking with you today. As I've told uh, many of uh, my students, well, I've told all my students uh, for more than 15 years that your success is my number one priority. And uh, for the last five years, I've officially been serving as the deputy chairperson for the business management department. And uh, James Lynch is the, uh, the chairperson of the business management department. And he's uh, here with us today. And uh, he's doing an excellent job. Both of us are committed to providing an excellent educational experience for our students and providing them with skills that are gonna help them be successful in their career. Uh, there's uh, something that you'll notice about James and I that we have in common, right, James? Uh, we both go to the same barber. And uh, say, say something, uh, James, so the students can um, get- I wasn't to prepared to say anything. I'm so glad to be opportunity to see you guys do this wonderful presentation. It's really exciting. 
I'm glad to have the students get a chance because so many times students have been getting confused uh, with regards to the online mod modalities of learning. So this is really exciting and I hope the beginning of the future. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you, James. I, I want to comment on a couple of things that I heard so far, and then we'll uh, cover some other topics. But um, something that uh, Rich Vento mentioned, which is so important, is the fact that um, the experience is not just um, one that occurs because of the faculty member, but it's really about the interaction between the faculty member and the students. And uh, having given so many lectures and presentations, I agree with what Rich said about being able to see the students on the screen. So if you're not in the classroom, because in the classroom, we could see when a student frowns, we could see when a student smiles, and we do really feed off of that. All performers feed off of the interaction with the, with the audience. So keep that in mind. We understand that you're not always gonna be able to share your video, um, and we respect that, uh, but it is so helpful to be able to read the audience, if you will, and see if students seem puzzled or, um, or they're enjoying uh, what you're saying um, and things are going well and that students are engaged. Also, uh, Rich had mentioned about uh, the syllabus. Uh, this is so critical to review the syllabus and um, the requirements for every course are gonna be different. We have five learning goals for every course in the School of Business, right? Those are the learning goal, goals that every school in the biz, School of Business has, right? They don't vary, um, but the objectives for each course varies. But you have to read the syllabus. You really do. And I, I chuckle sometimes when students say, um, when is the exam, Coach B? And I say, hey, I know you didn't read all 12 pages of my syllabus, but on the first page is the date and time of the exam. So you really have to, faculty put a lot of time into the syllabus and it's the roadmap for the course. That's meant to help keep you and the, the faculty member uh, on track. Um, and as uh, Professor Fox said, you need to check your email and uh, Blackboard regularly so that you have um, an idea of what's going on in the course. I mean. Uh, I try to minimize the number of changes. I mean, in fact, I rarely deviate from the syllabus, but I do send a lot of reminders. I send at least one email every week to the team, to the students, to, uh, to remind them about key dates, about reading assignments and, um, and written assignments as well. So with that said, here's a couple of specific things on the next slide that um, I'd like to talk to you about in a, in a little bit more detail. I could talk about uh, online teaching for hours and hours. In fact, I've done a lot of research on online education. I've written papers about online education and I've been teaching online for more than a decade. And the key things I wanna share with you today, right? This is just a thumbnail of some, some key points is about the difference between being a student and a learner, the importance of accessing Blackboard, why it's important to post introductions, how you should go about preparing assignments, what it's like to take exams online, and then having a meeting online, a class meeting. Next slide. So why is viewing yourself as a learner so important? Often um, we think of ourselves as students, which in some ways is passive. Um, we go to class, and students uh, all take a seat and they're ready for Coach B to entertain them, put on a show, tell some jokes, do it a little dance. I don't know, students have a variety of, of, of experiences, uh, but we really think it's so important to think of yourself as a learner and to be actively engaged uh, in your education and the benefit uh, of being a learner is that you're gonna develop skills, right? So you need to change your mindset, not just because of uh, uh, remote learning or because of the pandemic, but in general, I wanna encourage you to think of yourself as a learner because in the School of Business, we want students to graduate with skills. Um, 
It's important that you should be familiar with key concepts and key terms, and you might memorize some of them, but um, you need to be able to show evidence that you have skills when you graduate, because it's not enough to have a diploma. I sense from some students that they think it's enough to have a diploma, but everyone going on an interview for a job has a diploma, right? Everybody who's going for the interview that you're interviewing for, the job you're interviewing for, has a diploma. You have to show that you not only have a diploma, but you have skills, that you could do stuff, right? Like use Excel, for example. So, you know, 15 years ago, I had a student who took me into her confidence and she said, hey, she said, if you want to be popular, don't give any projects. Well, um, I didn't take her advice and I give a project in all my classes. And from what I could tell, I don't think it had any uh, significant negative impact on my popularity. So it's important to um, learn the material in a way that is experiential, which is what we call learning by doing. So you read the book, um, that's important. You have to read the book for every course, right? But that's a little bit passive. What we're focusing on is learning by doing. So you should expect to have uh, projects. And importantly, you want to share those with um, interviewers, with executives, because it provides evidence of your skills. This summer, I taught a course in uh, global communication. And we talked about um, some, uh, some important issues, as Professor Fox mentioned, in this historical moment. We talked about racism and prejudice and discrimination and ethnic identities and racial identities. And, uh, but we, I also had the students analyze a Harvard case study and analyze a data set using Excel. So it's important to have um, skills. Now those students, they prepared reports. Um, it's a graduate class. Um, their reports were over 100 pages. And now they have a project that they could share with interviewers, with executives. Everybody says they know how to use Excel. I've been using Excel from 1994, and I don't consider myself to be an expert. I use it extensively, but I don't consider myself to be an expert. But everybody puts on their resume that they know how to use Excel. Clicking on the Excel icon does not make you an expert in Excel, right? But now I have students that um, created 59 histograms 59 frequency distribution tables and 59 pie charts that shows, yeah, somebody, it's very convincing um, when you say, I know how to use Excel. Not that you're an expert, but that you know how to use Excel. Uh, next slide. So as Professor Fox mentioned, Blackboard is the learning management system that we use. It's a very big company. Uh, we've been using Blackboard for many years. Uh, I use Blackboard um, for all my courses, whether they're online or not. Um, the university has invested a significant amount of money um, in Blackboard. It's a university-wide system, so all 25 campuses use Blackboard. I hope, as uh, Professor Fox mentioned, that all faculty are using Blackboard because um, ideally it's a one-stop shop, if you will, for students. Um, as opposed to some courses being on Blackboard and some courses being on other platforms. Um, but this is where the course lives. So now more than ever, we're not meeting on campus and we're housing all the course documents on Blackboard. That's where you have to submit your assignments. Assignments are not submitted through email. Um, that's so cumbersome. I remember my first semester <laughs> teaching before, um, by, by semester two, I was on Blackboard. First semester, it was a little overwhelming. That was 16 years ago. Um, I saw the students email me their assignments and they kept emailing them even after the semester ended, they kept sending, <laughs> they kept sending them to me. So Blackboard is a very efficient way um, to submit work. It's efficient for students, it's efficient for uh, faculty. And that's where you're going to have discussion boards, right? That's where you're going to have discussions. Faculty uh, very often will set up discussion boards where you could talk about particular concepts, whether it's a 
concept about um, marketing or it's a concept about finance or a concept about sociology. And the whole idea of Blackboard um, is that it's trying to simulate the in-class experience. What I love about discussion boards is, um, is the posts, right? Because every student who does a discussion board in my class has to make three posts. They address the question, right? The issue that's raised. They comment on somebody else's post. And I tell them it's gotta be more than I agree, right? It's gotta be something thoughtful. And they ask a thoughtful question of somebody else's post. <clears throat> Every student participates in this, but anybody who's uh, uh, taught a class knows that typically <clears throat> out of, let's say like our classes, typically we have 35, 40 students. You have the th same three to four to five students that participate every time. And the other 30 students are um, participating silently, right? But with the discussion board, which I find so insightful um, and, and stimulating and exciting is that every student participates. And I know students who took courses with me that were in person and didn't say anything the entire semester. And but when they took an online course with me, they had so many meaningful and relevant and interesting ideas that they posted on the discussion board. And it's not just the faculty member that reads them, but also everybody in the class is able to read discussion boards. <clears throat> so your written assignments, if you're writing a marketing plan, only you and your professor could see those. Discussion boards, everybody in the team could see them. Everybody in the class could see them. And so you can learn from um, your colleagues. You can learn from other students, other learners in the class. It's not just the, the professor. Years ago, um, there was a heavy reliance on the professor um, because the internet didn't exist. And believe it or not, that wasn't so long ago. So you actually, you really had to go to class to hear what the professor had to say because you, there was no such thing as Google. You had to, if you missed the lecture, you, you, it's unlikely, right, um, that you would do well on the exam. But with these um, technologies, and Blackboard is certainly an important uh, online technology, there's so much that you can learn from students in the class. So other students, it's not just about what I have to say, or Professor Lynch has to say, or Professor Fox has to say, or Dr. Who. Um, you can learn from each other. And that's why, like Rich Vento mentioned about study groups. Yeah, that's, that's important. That's helpful. You're going to learn from other students in the class. You post your introductions on Blackboard. And um, that's uh, certainly a good way to connect with other students, um, to share a little bit about yourself, and to, uh, to meet people that uh, you could uh, have study groups with. And on the next slide, um, I want to share a little bit more about why it's so important to post introductions, <clears throat> especially in a classroom, um, and certainly in, in, in larger classes, it becomes even uh, more important. But the introduction, which I know sometimes maybe you, I don't know, I, I think sometimes um, students might think it's silly to post an introduction. Why do I have to, um, to, to post an introduction? Well, first of all, <clears throat> faculty are required to submit attendance. So the federal government and the state requires that faculty submit attendance. So you don't have any visibility on that per se. Faculty have to go in each semester and within the first couple of weeks indicate whether each and every student is in attendance. So it's not each and every student, okay? <laughs> not just in general, yes, the kids showed up. No, every single student has to be um, accounted for. So it's critical because introductions are often used to determine attendance. It's an online course. How are we going to know if you're attending? It's not like you showed up um, to uh, a classroom in uh, 205 Whitehead Hall. So it's very important to uh, post an introduction. I know many of my colleagues um, have students post introductions as well. It's uh, 
a good way to interact with your classmates and also your instructor. <clears throat> and importantly, it establishes a sense of community. This is so critical. Like Rich Vento said, you're not uh, learning alone. You're not alone. Um, you're a part of a community. You're part of the Brooklyn College community. You're part of the Culperman School of Business community. You're part of the Business Management Department community. You're part of the class, right? The community that is formed by that class coming together. So it is important. You should take it seriously. Obviously, you could see the posts of uh, other members of the class, and hopefully it gets you to feel like, okay, I'm part of uh, this experience. Uh, you could share what you feel comfortable with. You know, I post mine. Uh, I share a bit about myself, uh, my interests, and uh, students could post whatever they feel uh, comfortable sharing. Some students post about, you know, where they're originally from, because, you know, certainly Brooklyn College, um, our mission is to provide educational access to uh, a group of uh, mostly immigrant families. And um, that's so important to, to what we do. So preparing assignments. Okay, so one of the things you need to do is you need to read the instructions carefully. Um, you know, all those words that uh, the professor provides, or maybe sends you in an email or puts on the outside of the folder on Blackboard, uh, those are the instructions. <laughs> Sometimes students skip that and they start to work on the Excel project. You need to read the instructions. And if you have questions, ask. My students um, uh, have been texting me for over a decade. Students could text me, they could call me, they could email me. Work ahead on the assignments because I could tell you, having uh, taught many classes and taught thousands of students, I would never expect that a student would start working on the assignment the day that it's due. Never, it, it's not the, I would never, I don't expect the, the assignment to take 12 hours, but I would never think that you're gonna start um, the assignment at eight o'clock at night and submit it at 9 p.m. I would never expect that. So, and in fact, I view it as the deadline, okay? That's not the due date, that's the latest that you could submit it. So I always encourage my students, um, as it says in the next bullet, to submit before the deadline. And importantly, when you submit a paper, you should include in-text citations and bibliography because otherwise someone might think that you're plagiarizing the work of others. Of course, you can't write a SWOT analysis about Walmart. Uh, I could because I've been to Walmart headquarters many times um, and I know a lot about their company, but obviously information literacy, which is one of our learning goals, you are gonna gather information about Walmart. And there's a lot of SWOT analyses about Walmart, for example, online, but you need to give credit. You need to have in-text citation that says, I got this from this website and then provide um, your perspective because your success is our number one priority. And you know that plagiarism is a very serious um, academic offense, but you could avoid that by just recognizing the author of the material, right? Nobody thinks in a zillion years that you wrote a SWOT analysis about Coca-Cola on your, on your own. How would you? You're not an industry expert, okay? So help yourself, right? Include in-text citations and a bibliography. Next slide. Okay, how should you prepare for online exams? Well, you need to study. Um, online exams are uh, not easier. Um, there's uh, concerns about academic integrity as it relates to online exams. I've given online exams to thousands of students. Uh, I know sometimes my colleagues think that students all get 100. It's absolutely not true. Uh, maybe some of you, some students on this uh, Zoom session today might think that, uh, or might be surprised to hear that some students get 30s and 40s on online exams. So you have to appreciate that um, there are some parameters that are in control of the faculty member, which is um, the time limit. So sometimes students say, I didn't have enough time. I know you're not gonna have enough time to look up all the answers. 
Okay, so you need to, <laughs> to manage expectations. That's not that type of assignment. Um, so I don't, to me, I think an exam is about testing and learning. I tell my students, if you want to look, look it up in the book, that's fine, but you're only going to be able to look up a couple. You're not going to have enough time to do that, right? So think about it, 50 questions, standard exam time, amount, and 75 minutes. You're not going to have enough time to look up all the answers. So you really need to study, and you need to be sure that you know the date and the time of the exam. Uh, Rich, I think, also mentioned about technology and also uh, uh, Maddie, you need to make sure that your laptop battery is fully charged. I know that sounds like a blinding glimpse of the obvious, but let me tell you something. I've given a lot of online exams, okay? You need to make sure that your laptop battery is, is charged and you need to have a secure internet connection. They, um, there's been a, quite a few companies that have been willing to provide free internet, um, certainly over the last uh, few months, uh, to students. So make sure you have a secure internet connection because you're doing, all our courses are gonna be online uh, in the fall. Now, for 15 years or more in the School of Business, we've been offering online courses. Uh, many of our colleagues uh, in the School of Business have been teaching online. And um, there's courses that are synchronous, as uh, Professor Fox was saying, and some that are asynchronous. So we've been teaching for 15 years courses in an asynchronous manner, which, um, which means that there's not a set day and time for the students and the instructor to meet. How do we make the best of online meetings? Well, you should be prepared, just like uh, you would uh, read the chapter ideally before you come to class. You should also make sure that when you come to the um, Zoom session or you're using Blackboard Collaborate, um, that you're prepared, that you take notes, and it's important to uh, engage with the instructor as well. So um, I agree again with what Rich Vento said about um, putting your video on so that the instructor can see you and you can see the instructor. Uh, there needs to be uh, engagement. That's important that you wanna be engaged, we wanna be engaged as well. Next slide. That's it. <laughs> that was the last slide. <laughs> All right. Well, much. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Basso. Um, um, those are the wonderful ideas and suggestions for our students uh, to be a successful online learner. Um, and uh, everybody will have opportunity to review all the points uh, Professor Basso has put out uh, when you receive this PowerPoint uh, with emails uh, and um, uh, down the road. Um, so there are some very valuable information created by Brooklyn College, created by the team led by Professor Rich Bento. Uh, so I have those online links here, and this is for your to review uh, later on. <clears throat> so now we come to the final uh, portion of this webinar, that is the question and answers. Um, I believe some of you have already typed some questions in. If you haven't, uh, this is your time to ask any questions uh, to the panelists uh, in that chat box, okay? I send it to the host, Ashley, Elena, or you can send it to everyone that we all see it. And uh, so now I'm gonna turn over the um, Zoom to Elena and uh, Ashley to ask questions from those chatter box. Yeah. We haven't received any questions yet. So if you guys are typing it up, uh, just send them over. May I just add one thing? Uh, with the link that's in the chat box, uh, Miles mentioned academic integrity. And on the second link, I believe, in the chat, there is a blurb on academic integrity and identifying what it is and how to kind of protect yourself from inadvertently maybe plagiarizing something uh, just by way of not... Um, referencing something or citing something the correct way. And also, again, just a quick plug of that video for Blackboard, which was created by my colleague, uh, Dr. Lisa Schleibel, 
and her fantastic peer mentors who did a great job. So it really does help you navigate through the ins and outs and complete functionality of using Blackboard. It's not long, uh, but it really, really is comprehensive and very effective. Okay, thank you. Uh, we actually have our first question from Bradler. And he said, only one of my professors emailed me information regarding the class, so what should I do? Um, Maddie? I can jump in on other folks might have thoughts too, but um, I would say give, give your professors a few more days. Um, they are um, uh, working really hard and at getting prepared and um, some professors, you know, are just still putting the final pieces in place to be able to what the difference between um, teaching remotely and teaching in person one of the differences is you actually do much more work in setting up the entire course before the course even begins um, and then when you're teaching in person it's a little more sometimes you, you set up the, the beginning and then you set up the rest as it keeps going um, and that's a little different so faculty are working really hard right now um, they I think everyone has the aspiration to be in touch as soon as possible, but if they haven't been in touch yet, they will be in touch soon. Um, and um, I would, I would, you know, the, the semester starts next week, so they should be in touch soon. Um, and it may be that they get in touch at the very beginning of the semester. Yes, I, I agree with Professor Fox. I'm already in eight week in week eight of my uh, full semester <laughs> because I've been working all summer on my uh, my developing my full courses. So um, you could reach out to the faculty member. You know, sometimes you know a little nudge is uh, helpful. Um, sometimes they don't realize they might have thought that um, they had open Blackboard, but um, they uh, they didn't. So um, yeah, you could you could reach out to them. Uh, sometimes you know that could be very helpful to them. Communication is key. I got a question. Um, Jada asks, how long should we wait until we contact a professor if we don't see them from Blackboard? Um, my courses are already open, but uh, <laughs> so I like to lead by example with my colleagues. Um, if your course is not open now, um, I, I think you could, you could reach out to them. You, you should uh, reach out. Um, sometimes, you know, they need a little nudge. Um, uh, it's helpful. Um, a little pressure doesn't hurt anybody. So uh, officially the first day is Wednesday. Some faculty are in the mindset that they don't want to open their course until the first day. Um, even if, uh, but what I always tell my colleagues is that your course does not have to be 100% ready on, uh, you know, for you to open your course. There's things that, that the faculty member can um, keep hidden that they don't want students to see yet. So just open your course. I've been telling my students for weeks to post their introduction, right? So you could see the introduction. Students could um, get acclimated, look, um, you know, review PowerPoint um, presentations, et cetera, whatever it is that you want to make available, but at least open it. Things that your assignments that are still work in progress, I tell my colleagues, hide those, okay, when you're ready, then you could open it, but at least open up the course on Blackboard. So I, I, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I think James is gonna send an email to our colleagues and remind them <laughs> they should uh, open their course. Yes, I want to uh, chip in on as well. Um, so if you don't re uh, see your course open on Blackboard on the first day of class, which is uh, Wednesday next week, um, you can send an email to your faculty to your professor and a CC to the department chair of that faculty, okay? And we will uh, take uh, appropriate action if needed. Hopefully uh, this thing will go away by next Wednesday. Some faculty are probably still in the process of getting ready. So just be patient for a few more days. Great, uh, any more responses? Okay, uh, the next question is from Nadia. And are there any resources at the campus available, such as the library? You could access the Brooklyn College Library remotely. So you could access the databases uh, remotely. You could use uh, all the online resources, the uh, digital resources remotely, but physically the campus is closed. That's right. Library will not 
be open to accommodate physical uh, gathering of student study groups and all of those. So this, that's not a option. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Vanessa. She asked, teachers have a limit number of assignments they can put during the semester? answer that um, there is no particular limit or uh, but um, I'll just say that you know um, the faculty are um, uh, you know out of so there's two things going on this semester one is that faculty um, have want very much and are committed to um, all of you getting the education you deserve like we talked about so there are, we are gonna learn this semester in our classes um, and there will be, um, you know, we're gonna have rigorous classes. They're gonna be, someone asked earlier, I think in the chat, are college classes way more difficult than high school classes? I think the students will be better to answer that than the faculty here, but um, we should all be prepared to work and there will be assignments. There's no particular limit. The assignments hopefully will be challenging in a delicious way that makes you you know feel like your brain is growing and you're learning and that's what you're here in college for and also we're all talking as faculty about being like we talked about before um uh empathetic and understanding and flexible in in light of the the complex situation we all find ourselves in because of the pandemic so um, that may impact how assignments are structured. There might be multiple options in terms of how to do assignments or um, you should absolutely communicate with your faculty member about any particular needs or issues you have. Yeah, and I would also add um, closely related to that is that everybody is experiencing um, this historical moment together. Um, yes, of course, students have been impacted by the pandemic, but so have faculty. Um, so faculty are really trying to work their, um, work their way through the situation as well. So that's why I encourage, you know, teamwork, collaborate. Collaboration is so important that uh, faculty and students collaborate um, and work together. Uh, the spring was certainly very unique, but again, I, I really applaud the students and the faculty for, um, coming together and reaching the finish line. It was extraordinary, really extraordinary, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, there is another question from Karen, and she says, some courses on Blackboard show that instructor is not currently available. Yeah, so it's when, until the faculty member goes in and activates the course, um, the students are not gonna be able to see it, right? They might be able to see a link, but if it says currently unavailable, that means the instructor did not open the course. Great. There was another question that came in saying, may I know there is any other person I can mainly contact for credit transfers from my previous university? I'm a data analy analyst graduate student. Um, that would be me. <laughs> you could email me. Um, what's the name of the student? I do not know how to pronounce it. Okay. You, oh. You yes. know, man. Oh, I think that's oh, one you. of my students. You. Yes. You could email it to me. Um, email me the transcript and I could uh, evaluate it. Do we have any more questions? Uh, please send them in right now. Okay, there's another question. How to take exams remotely will look like? So exams typically are um, completed on Blackboard and uh, it's um, like completing any other assignment using uh, Blackboard. There's no uh, electronic monitoring 
We have never used that um, in 15 years. And again, I don't see any evidence of uh, breaches of academic integrity. Again, in my mind, I don't mind if the students use the book, but you have to remember, you're not going to have enough uh, time to look up all the answers. So if a student looks up an uh, answer during the exam, I, to me, I, that, doesn't, that doesn't bother me. You know, I'm too, too, too student focused. I mean, I don't see that as like cheating. I don't, okay, look it up. That's great. Learn during the process of taking the exam. But um, uh, exams are time. So what's going to happen is you're going to log into your Blackboard course. There's going to be a folder that says like exam, click here. And inside that folder is going to be the link to the exam. And the professor is going to indicate the date and time. And you, the exam might be from 8 p.m. to 9.15. And uh, so you're going to have 75 minutes. And the questions are typically going to be uh, multiple choice and true, false. But uh, not all courses are going to have these kind of like high stakes exams. So you might also have to write a marketing plan, which could be 50% of your grade. Or you could have... Uh, other homework that could be uh, worth five points each. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, anyone um, else with questions? Okay, so we are about to uh, reach to our end of the webinar. And I want to thank all our panelists, three professors uh, for the wonderful our recommendations and ideas to our students. And I also want to thank all of our students for your commitment to learning, for your perseverance in this kind of very challenging environment. I know you are going to be extraordinarily successful. If you go through this unprecedented once a, a thousand year pandemic and emerge victoriously, right? Um, so, in addition to the resources provided by the university, by the school, by the faculty, uh, there are also other wonderful opportunities that students should take advantage. That is our student clubs. Today, we have two club leadership, um, two club presidents uh, presenting, co-hosting this, and uh, their clubs will be a, uh, another important venue for you to get help, right? Certain questions you might uh, be a little bit hesitant to ask professors or ask, uh, you know, school administration or ask our offices. But it'll be so much easier if you can discuss with your peers. And that's what those student clubs here are for. They are here to ready to help you to and peers on um, you know, any issues you want to discuss. So now I'd like to ask uh, Ashley and uh, Elena in that order to have a couple minutes talking about your clubs and services you provide to the students. Hi everyone. So my name is Ashley Rohit and I am the president of NAPA, which stands for National Associate of Black Accountants. And we help underrepresented minorities and to face that face difficult challenges that in the world of accounting or any business major. And we, we help in network opportunities, internship jobs, anything that you can think of to help you professionally develop your skills as an individual to become a professional leader in corporate America, we are here for you. We have students who got jobs and internships from all the big fours, um, mid-sized companies like Eisen Amper, um, Grant Thornton, JP Morgan, all of those and we actually you don't have to be an accounting major to join the club you can be any major we had a vice president who was an english major we had we have marketing majors who got an internship at snapchat and it's just we're here for you if you need help we will be here we will help you with interview process the process for especially in the virtual environment um, we actually have our first event coming up september 1st um at from 12 30 to 2 and it's a meet and greet, so you'll learn more in depth about the club and what we have to offer you in more in depth. Um, and we'll share the link for the reservation in the chat. Thank you, Ashley. Elena? Great, yeah. Uh, so our organization is more, not so much of a club, but it's actually a student advisory board. And we work uh, together with the dean, the faculty, and the students 
and the businesses around uh, to create a culture and community within the, the Copperman School of Business. Uh, we're structured in a way that provides each each member uh, opportunity to really excel in their leadership skills and and as uh, Professor Bassell said, like you learn a lot outside of the classroom and it's not just a diploma; it's the skills that you gain uh, through your experience during school. So it is really, really a wonderful opportunity to have have a be on a team and work with other people, but also be involved with creating. A community and mentoring and giving back but also gaining incredible ex experience and networking with big companies and um, just learning how to be in that room and uh, and talk to people so uh, I will link I will send in the chat uh, my LinkedIn if you have any questions uh, the website for our our organization and also the application form we are recruiting right now so uh, send me any questions that you have or feedback. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, do we have other student club presence here? Any any other student clubs that I am not aware uh, you want to speak? Well, if I could be so bold to speak on behalf of the Marketing Global Leadership Academic Association, Try saying that three times fast. Um, we, uh, a group of students and myself, founded that organization in 2009, MGLAA. And um, we are actually um, a chapter of the American Marketing Association, which is uh, the industry uh, um, leader for professional marketers. And um, I'm the... Uh, advisor, myself, and also Professor Sonia Lambert, who is the assistant deputy chairperson for the business management department. So um, if you're interested in marketing um, and leadership uh, in particular, uh, you could uh, reach out to me or uh, Professor Sonia Lambert. Okay, well, thank you very much. I guess that uh, <clears throat> we have come to the end of this uh, webinar. And if you find this webinar um, useful, helpful, uh, any comments and suggestions. We may do more of this type uh, throughout the semester. Our goal is to help our students to succeed. And uh, <clears throat> for those who have not, uh, um, who don't know me yet, <laughs> I am the Dean of the Kaufman School of Business. I'm new here. I just joined the school on July 1st. I am very, very happy uh, to have this opportunity to work with all of you and uh, the students every day never stop uh, uh, inspiring me. Uh, every time I meet with students with groups and participating in uh, different webinars, uh, I am so inspired by, by how talented our students are and uh, we will do everything we can um, to help you succeed. Um, I'll put that as my top priority, that is to help students to succeed in your academic studies while you're here and to succeed in your professional career when you graduate. So thank you all for coming and we're looking forward to see you on uh, many other occasions. And also I'm looking forward to your feedback and comments and suggestions. My email is available on the school website. So please write to me directly and uh, we'll see, uh, wish everybody a very successful fall semester and a successful academic experience and uh, academic studies in the Kaufman School of Business. Bye-bye, everybody.